Luke 18, uh, 35 through 43 is where we're going to be today. So if you have a Bible, if you have an app, if you don't want to go ahead and turn there, that's, that's where we're going to be hanging out. And we've, we've moved uh, pretty far from where we've been in this series. The last two weeks, we've been exclusively in Luke chapter 4. So not only have we jumped ahead quite a few chapters, uh, but also some, some pretty good distance as well. For the last two weeks, Jesus has, has begun his public ministry in an area called Galilee. That's the region made up of many towns. He's been in the town of Nazareth. Last week he was in the town of Capernaum. Now in Luke 18, he's in a completely different region, the region of Judea, and he's visiting the town of Jericho. A lot of time has also passed. Like we said, Luke 4 is the beginning of Jesus' public ministry. Luke 18 is closer to the end of that three-year earthly ministry. Uh, and so it's, it's worth repeating that this series, this series though rooted in some truth we find in Luke 4, it's not a series about Luke 4. It's not even a series about the gospel of Luke. That would take us way more than five weeks. This is a series about Advent. Uh, and Advent meaning the arrival of Jesus as the king who will sit on his throne for all of eternity. This is a series all about that arrival. And as we've said multiple times, that arrival, the revealing of who Jesus is, is something that was slowly revealed throughout his public ministry. In fact, everything that Jesus did, everything that Jesus Jesus said was contributing to a bigger and bigger picture of who he was, climaxing and culminating in the cross, the ultimate picture of the Savior he came to be. And that truth, that truth that this entire series is rooted in, that we find in Luke chapter 4, is a truth that Jesus would have reiterated again and again and again. It's likely every single town he went to, anytime he was given the opportunity to preach, he was emphasizing this truth. Maybe not always in the same form, but this was the theme, this was the purpose statement that drove his ministry. And here's what Jesus says in Luke chapter four. He says, the spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. This is the purpose of Jesus's ministry. The Holy Spirit is driving it. The Holy Spirit is empowering it. And the action that the Holy Spirit is bringing about is that Jesus is proclaiming good news to the poor. But as we studied that passage a couple weeks ago, we looked at that word poor and we understood that in that context, Context, it's a little different than how we typically use it now. When we talk about being poor, typically we're talking about someone of low financial status. But back then it had a much broader understanding. Poor was anyone who was lacking anything, anyone who wasn't whole. And so we came to, to kind of uh, translate it this way. The, the spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to all broken people people. And spoiler alert, that's everybody. Everybody's broken in some form or fashion. As human beings, we are simply broken. We suffer from a disease called sin. It has a result called death. And Jesus came to conquer that. He came to preach good news that broken people like us had the opportunity to be redeemed. And this purpose statement, this purpose statement that would drive Jesus's public ministry was supported by three bullet points, three action items, the actual things that Jesus would come to do. First, proclaim freedom for the prisoners. We looked at that last week. In Capernaum, Jesus encountered a man who was possessed by a demon, held captive by darkness, and Jesus set him free. And then he came to uh, proclaim recovery of sight for the blind. That's where we're going today. Next week, we'll get into the fact that he came to set the oppressed free, all of which will culminate on Christmas Eve with this celebratory conclusion statement that Jesus came to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And here's what that means. We'll get into it on Christmas Eve. It means he's come to bring a brand new reality where all of this is true, where broken people have encountered good news. They've been set free. They are able to see and they are no longer oppressed because the Lord's favor is reigning through the king who sits on his throne for all of eternity. This is what Jesus came to do. And like I said, today, 
Today we're talking about the fact that Jesus came to encounter blindness. And the story that Luke uses to emphasize that we find in Luke chapter 18. Now we get little hints throughout the gospel of Luke that Jesus encountered other blind people. But this is the first time we, we kind of get a more elaborate story about the encountering of blindness. And, and it happens as Jesus is on his way into Jericho. But Jericho is not his destination. Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. Um, most notably because there's a big feast and celebration that's about to happen there. It's called the Passover festival and lots and lots of Jews would have made the pilgrimage to Jerusalem for this festival every single year. In fact, Jesus is not traveling alone. He's traveling with the 12 disciples, which is typically the case, but he's also joined by lots of other followers who are moving to Jerusalem with him to participate in the Passover with him. This was actually a very common scene. People often did this on their way to Passover. They would travel together. It was a far safer way of traveling. You didn't want to travel in smaller groups. The road was dangerous. You certainly didn't want to travel alone. And so people found strength in numbers. So very, very common scene. There was also the added bonus that in this particular group, there, there was a rabbi present, a teacher in the form of Jesus. So if, if you were traveling somewhere in a group of people and there was a rabbi present, you were even more drawn to walk with that group. Why? Because it was customary that as rabbis walked, they talked. They taught on their way. It's like first century podcasting. Like literally you just got to travel and listen in to what this rabbi had to say. And these people are completely enamored, completely hanging on every word that Jesus has to say on the way to Jerusalem. So he's teaching the whole way. The scene in Jericho is also a very familiar scene in, in circumstances like this. Luke tells us that the streets are lined with people wishing these travelers well. This isn't out of the ordinary at all. This was actually very, very common. People who didn't have the means or didn't have the capability to make it to Jerusalem themselves for festivals like this, this is what they would do. This was their way of participating. They'd stand on the side of the road and they'd simply wish these people well as they'd pass. They'd pray blessings over their journey. And in the midst of those bystanders, that's where we meet this blind man. This blind man would, would have also been a very common fixture in crowds like this. In fact, it's estimated that 10% of the population back then, 10% of society was made up of people like this, people experiencing debilitating disabilities that, that, in, that disabled them from, from truly participating in society. They, they were commonly referred to as expendables, people who were just kind of there. And the reason they were looked at that way is because these people relied 100% on the uh, generosity of others in order to survive. They did not contribute to society themselves. Instead, they, they benefited from a generous society that, that allowed them to survive. And so here we have this blind beggar. This is what he's been reduced to. This is his lot in life. He, he cannot see, and so he begs day in and day out, relies on the generosity of other people. And this blind beggar realizes there's a commotion happening in his town of Jericho. And so he asks, what's going on? And the people tell him, Jesus the Nazarene is passing by. Now, very unlikely that they said Jesus the Nazarene. It's most likely that they said the Nazarene. Remember, we are far from where Jesus began his ministry, where, where he grew up in Galilee, uh, specifically the town of Nazareth. So outside of Galilee, and really for the most part outside of Nazareth, people wouldn't have been as familiar with Jesus, but they've certainly heard about what Jesus is doing. And so the stories precede him of the, the incredible things he's done. But most people that, that weren't familiar with exactly who he is likely would have just referred to him as the Nazarene, the Nazarene who does crazy, unbelievable stuff, the Nazarene who's been doing some really cool things. And so when this blind man says, like, who, what's going on? What's all this commotion? They're like, the Nazarene, you know, the Nazarene, the Nazarene who does incredible things. He's walking by right now. Now, but what's really interesting and what's really powerful is how this blind man responds. He says this in, in, in verse 38, he called out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Those who led the way rebuked him and told him to be quiet, but he shouted all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. 
And what's really, really interesting about this is, is, is the way that this blind man refers to Jesus indicates that he's not just familiar with what Jesus has been doing. He's not just familiar with the, the miracles or the profound teaching. He's, he's ultimately familiar with who Jesus is. That's indicated by what he calls me. He says, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. What does this indicate? It indicates that he's familiar with the prophecy given to David a long, long time ago. The prophecy that someone would come from his blood line, a son of David, and sit on the throne for all of eternity. This blind man is declaring for all to hear, that's the guy. That's the guy that's going to sit on the throne for all of eternity. He's the king of all kings. He's the descendant of David. He's the prophet we've been waiting for. And he's more than a prophet. He's a king, but he's more than a king. He's a savior. He's the one that's come to bring mercy. So what does he ask for? He says, have mercy on me. And isn't it interesting that, that in that culture and, and also in ours, it's the people that are in the most obvious need, the people that are in the most obvious affliction that often are the most willing to just simply own it. And I think we immediately explain that away by like, yeah, but they don't have a choice. Like, it's not like they can hide their affliction. It's so obvious to everyone. Like they might as well just own it. I mean, it's not like this blind man could have convinced anyone that he wasn't blind. The jig would have been up almost immediately because he simply couldn't make it. Like, like he'd run into stuff and he'd trip over things and, and people would know immediately, like people would have to have conversations with him. Like, like Frank, like, listen, like there's something going on. You keep tripping over things that you should not trip over, like very obvious things, but you trip over them. Frank, I think there's something going on with you. The jig would have been up almost immediately. He, he could have hide, hidden it even if he wanted. But what's interesting about this blind man is the urgency the sense of urgency that, that he is going to capitalize on this moment. It's almost like he's been waiting for this moment. And now he's in this moment and he's not going to let this moment pass us by. And we, we see that in the original language. The first time he yells out to him, the language indicates that he yelled. He just, he just raised his voice in order to be heard. But then he's silenced. And then the second time he calls out, it says this, but he shouted all the more. The language indicates there that, that what preceded his request was this kind of inaudible guttural scream. And so it's literally as though the first time he hears that Jesus the Nazarene is walking by, he's like, hey, hey, have mercy on me, son of David. But then he's told to be quiet. And so the second time he starts by going, ah, have mercy on me. He is going to do absolutely whatever it takes to get the attention of Jesus as he passes by. But, but he is silenced by, by people. And, and that's worth noting as well because it's significant. Notice what it says. He, he's, he, those who led the way rebuked him and told him to be quiet. It wasn't other people in, in the crowd of bystanders. It was the actual people in the band of travelers walking in front of Jesus, who rebuke this man, who correct him and tell him, you need to be silent. It's the people who are with Jesus that want him to be quiet. Now, why? Why, why would they want him to be quiet? Well, remember, they're on a journey for the strength in numbers is their primary goal, but they've got the added bonus. That they're walking with their rabbi and he's teaching. And they want to hear what he has to say. I mean, they're hanging on every word. And all of a sudden there's this guy in Jericho who's screaming and he's drowning it out. And they want to hear Jesus. So they're telling this guy, hey, you got to keep it down. But, but it's a very ironic situation if you think about it. Because what would Jesus have been talking about? He would have been talking about his kingdom. He would have been articulating his kingdom to these people. And so literally, it's kind of funny when you think about it. These people hanging on every word are likely yelling to this guy like, hey, don't you understand what Jesus is doing right now? He's telling us about his kingdom. He's telling us about the good news he brought for all people. So could you please be quiet so we can hear more about how he's going to restore sight to the blind, blind guy. Like it's an incredibly ironic situation. These people are so consumed with the words of Jesus. They're completely missing the fact that the very one Jesus came to bring those words to is standing to the side, yet they're telling him to be quiet. And as annoyed as, as the crowd walking with Jesus would have been, there, there would have been a group of people that were likely even more annoyed. And that would have been the disciples. Okay, this is just another day to them, the whole interruption thing. Like this happens all the time. Everywhere they go, Jesus is dropping truth bombs, but there's other people who are like, ah, Jesus, 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 trying to get his attention. They've grown rather used to this. However, on this particular day, I would imagine the disciples are in somewhat of a hurry to get to Jerusalem. Why? Because of something that Jesus has recently told them. 
In fact, just before they they set out for Jerusalem, Jesus said to them one of the most confusing things he had ever said to them before. We don't have to go back far in Luke to to find it. We just got to go back to verse 31. Jesus took the 12 aside and told them, we are going up to Jerusalem and everything that is written by the prophets about the Son of Man will be fulfilled. He will be delivered over to the Gentiles. They will mock him, insult him, and spit on him. They will flog him and kill him. On the third day, he will rise again. And so he takes his disciples aside and he says, good news, guys, guys, we're going to head to Jerusalem. And guess what's going to happen there? Everything that's true about me is going to be revealed. All of it is going to be fulfilled. Isn't that great news? And they're probably nodding like, yeah, that's fantastic. That's why we've been doing everything. And Jesus is like, one thing, though, when we get there, I'm going to be turned over to the Gentiles. They're going to mock me. They're going to insult me. They're likely going to spit on me. Then they're going to flog me. Then they're going to kill me. In fact, what what we're walking into is going to be really, really not awesome. It's, in fact, going to be the darkest day in history. Good news, though, just after it, it's going to be the brightest day in all history because I'll rise again. It's all going to be okay. But here's how the disciples respond in verse 34. The disciples did not understand any of this. Its meaning was hidden from them. And they did not know what he was talking about. Their responses literally say, what? Like, what are you talking about? Jesus, you're you're, going to be taken by the Gentiles and and you're going to be mocked and then you're going to be insulted and then they're going to spit on you and then they're going to flog you and then they're going to kill you. And you're saying this is a good day. Like, what on earth does that? You're saying lots of words. I understand there's a connection between these words. I'm not seeing the connection. I don't understand what you're talking about. But then Jesus just kind of lets them marinate on it. In fact, the entire journey to Jerusalem, he's letting them process this and think about it. It wouldn't be until they're in Jerusalem, like just before the terrible stuff is about to happen, that he again helps them process again. They still don't get it even then. But now in Jericho, they have no clue what's about to happen. But what they do know is that clarity is in Jerusalem. And they want to get there. And so I can't imagine how frustrated they likely were with this interruption. Why? Because they knew how Jesus was going to respond to it. They'd seen it a thousand times before. This is what Jesus does. And sure enough, Jesus does exactly what they think. In verse 40, Jesus stops and ordered the man to be brought to him. And this is huge. It's hugely important that we notice that Jesus stopped. Why? Because everything Jesus did was a teaching moment. Everything, And this isn't just for the blind beggar. It's for the blind beggar. It's absolutely to illustrate to him, hey, you're exactly right about me. I am the son of David. I did come to sit on a throne for all of eternity. And you are absolutely right. The thing I brought with me is mercy. And mercy stops. And mercy is going to encounter you today. But Jesus is also teaching the crowd. That crowd of followers who who are frustrated with the interruption, Jesus needs them to understand the gospel, the good news that I came to bring. It's more than words. It's backed up with actions. In fact, it can't just be words. It has to be backed up with actions. I'm bringing a tangible kingdom that's actually going to change people's circumstances. And you're getting ready to witness it right here, right now. I didn't come just to talk about good news. I came to bring it. I came to show it to people. And this blind man, he needs to see it. But Jesus also did this to to teach the disciples, to teach the disciples, hey, the gospel, what, what we're doing here, the kingdom we're bringing about, it's not a destination. It's a journey. And this journey, every single step matters. This step matters. Because he matters. So Jesus stops and he calls out to the blind man, blind man, come here, help help him get to me. Bring him over here. And then this is what happened. When he came near, Jesus asked him, what do you want me to do for you? Lord, I want to see, he replied. Jesus said to him, receive your sight. Your faith has healed you. Few crucial things we we need to notice here. Again, it's it's a short, compact truth here, but but there's just so much here. Number number one, the fact that Jesus asks him a question. He asks him, what do you want? 
I mean, it's the most unnecessary question in the history of questions. I mean, number one is Jesus. Jesus doesn't ever have to ask a question. Jesus knows what we need. He knows what you need better than you know what you need. Like he knows the depths of this man's need more than this man has even scratched the surface of his need. Jesus knows what he needs, but guess what? So does everybody else. We know exactly what this guy wants. The guy is blind. Obviously he wants to see. It's obvious what he wants. Why does Jesus ask the question? To emphasize the the importance of choice. That restoration, redemption, reconciliation, freedom is a choice that Jesus is enabling us to make. Grace is not a magic trick that just swoops in and sweeps us away whether we like it or not. You, You got hit by grace today. You're going with it whether... You're ready or not. No, that's not what grace is. Grace is an invitation. An invitation that's been extended by the Savior who came to deliver it. But an invitation requires a response. You send me an invitation to come to your house for dinner, and I receive that invitation. I read that invitation. I could say, yes, I want to come to your house for dinner. But guess what? I'm not at your house having dinner until I get up and go to your house and have dinner. I have to respond to the invitation. I have to follow through on what is inviting me to do. And that's grace. Jesus has enabled grace. Jesus has made the way, but we have to consciously decide to step into it. Jesus has come to bring great light by which everyone can see. But we have to consciously be willing to step out of the darkness. Jesus has made the way. We must be willing to follow. And that's the truth that Jesus is emphasizing by simply asking the question, what do you want? But then the second thing we need to notice is the man didn't hold back. Okay, he didn't suddenly get sheepish about this whole thing. He didn't suddenly try to, you know, like downplay his need. He was completely vulnerable before the Lord. He exposed the entire debt of his need. I cannot see. He didn't say, sometimes I struggle with sight, God. Sometimes life's difficult for me. Sometimes things are, no, he said, no, I am in complete and total need and I need you to drastically and completely change my circumstance. I wanna move from this all the way to this. I want to see. He's literally declaring to Jesus, I want to be healed and completely healed. I want to be restored and completely restored. I want to be redeemed. I want to be set free from everything that has afflicted me. And so Jesus says, so be it. You're going to have sight, but notice what Jesus says. It's your faith. Your faith did it. And this is huge because it it, it illustrates for us the important movement that this man has made. This man is not just simply responding to what Jesus can do. This man is responding to who Jesus is. He understands the why that's beyond the what. Yeah, Jesus, you can do incredible things. You, You can do this and you can do even greater things. But there's a reason that you're doing this. The why is that you've come to lead us to freedom. That's why you're doing all the things you're doing so that we can see with clear eyes who you are. The king who will sit on the throne forever. My Lord, my savior. That's faith. Faith is when we're willing to step beyond reason. Faith is when we're willing to step beyond rational. Faith is when we're willing to step beyond tangible evidence and believe instead in the who that we cannot see, who we can feel, and who impacts us on a daily basis, and who is in control, who is powerful and mighty to save. This blind man on the side of the road, he responded to who Jesus was and his circumstances were immediately altered. And this story, as I I hear this story, as I read this story, it it forces me to ask myself several questions, questions that I think we could benefit from here today together. And the first question is this, I have to ask myself, how often is my urgency to see Jesus more clearly impeded by my fear of exposing my weaknesses? How often do I drag junk through life because I'm terrified of anyone knowing about it? 
How often do, do, do I walk with a spiritual limp because I refuse to admit my own brokenness? How often do I wear a mask because I don't want anyone else to see what's really going on? And how foolish is it to believe that Jesus doesn't already know? This man knew that it was foolish to lie to Jesus. I mean, the, the king of all kings, who you've already declared to be so, is standing in front of you and asked you what you need. This man couldn't have said anything but the fact that, as you know, I'm blind. I need to see. I mean, it would have been pointless to say anything else. He, he, he knew in this moment, I, I can't let my weaknesses hold me back anymore. I need to step beyond them. I need to step out in faith and trust that Jesus is bigger than my brokenness. And he was willing to do it. Jesus already knows that I'm jacked up. Jesus already knows you are too. And here's the deal. Jesus isn't put off by our brokenness. He's drawn to it. I am why he came. You are why he came. He came to bring rescue. He came to proclaim good news to broken people, broken people like us. And so may we not be people that try to hide the brokenness but lay it in front of the one that can do something about it. The king of all kings. Second question we have to ask is this, how often does my obsession with knowing cause me to fail to see that my calling is doing? How often does my obsession with knowing all the answers impede my ability to take action on what's been done on my behalf. I'm talking about the crowd. Okay, they're, they're hanging on Jesus' every word, consumed with those words, but, but they find themselves in a moment where, where here's the culmination of those words. Here's the very thing those words have come to do. And what do they tell that need to do? Be quiet. You're interrupting the words. What Jesus came to establish is, is my kingdom, it's not simply based on words. There are words you absolutely need to hear. I'm going to articulate hope to you. But hope is an action. Je Jesus came to take action on our behalf. The first action was, was redeeming us, working literally on our behalf. But, but in that action, there, there was a byproduct and that, it's, that it set an example for me to follow. That's why James came to say that faith without works is dead. We, we can't just hang on the words. We've we got to do something about it. But at the same time, works without faith are just as dead. That's why we need an equal balance of it. We can't overcorrect in either direction. That's why James, James would go on to say that we must be hearers who are doers. Here's what that means. You need to be exposed to the words of Jesus on a regular basis, but you need to take great care and with great diligence, do them. You got to apply it. When you hear truth, you got to act on truth. When you hear that calling, you got to follow that calling. You've got to let the words penetrate your heart, and then you've got to take action. You've got to put one foot in front of the other. You've got to get your hands dirty. You can't just listen. You have to be a hearer who is a doer. Third question that, that we have to ask ourselves, how often is my fixation on what happens later blinding me? To what Christ is doing here and now. And this one was very, very complicated because we can come at this from, from a few different directions. One, one your, your fear of the future may be rooted in simply that, future, uh, fear. Uh, you know, your, your obsession with what will happen is completely rooted in fear of what might happen, uh, pain that you might have to encounter, losses that you might have to endure. You're terrified of what might happen and, and that results in you being paralyzed. But at the same time, your, your obsession with the future may be rooted in very hopeful things. You know it's going to get better. You know that there's a light at the end of the tunnel. But what you're experiencing now makes you want to skip this and just do that. You just keep saying to yourself, I just want to be there. I don't want to do this anymore. And we absolutely want to foster a hope for a future. Our, our future is bright with hope, but we can't allow our, our, our focus on the future to rob us of what Christ wants to do here and now. Right here, right now is where Christ has us. Right here, right now is where Christ desires to work in us the most. Right here, right now is where Christ desires to use us the most. Like the disciples, we, we can't allow ourselves to get consumed with, with the destination because the journey 
is what matters. The gospel is a journey and every single step matters. Right here matters. If you're going through good stuff right now, it matters. If you're going through hard stuff right now, it matters. And Christ is in, in it with you no matter what it is. Do not rob today by being consumed about tomorrow. Allow Christ to have today. Allow Christ to work in you today. Now, all of these questions, all, all of this is perfectly tied up in, in the conclusion of the story. The last verse, uh, Luke wraps it all up by saying immediately, meaning instantaneously. Okay, again, like Jesus has demonstrated this power again and again and again. When Jesus comes to combat darkness, light happens instantly. Okay, it shows that Jesus is completely in control, that he is absolutely that king that holds all the cards. Immediately he received his sights and followed Jesus, praising God. When all the people saw it, they also praised God. Jesus wants to open your eyes. Jesus wants to give you spiritual sight that is beyond 2020. Jesus wants you to see this life more clearly. Jesus wants you to see him more clearly. Jesus wants you to see him yourself more clearly and everything around you more clearly. But what good is all of that sight that Jesus can give us if it doesn't culminate to following him more closely? The moment he received sight, which was immediate, that man was no longer a blind beggar standing on the side of the road. He was a man who had sight, who was walking confidently with Jesus forward. It's obedience. It's what it all comes down to, obedience. Being willing to chase harder after Christ because of what he has done on our behalf. When Christ brings freedom, when Christ brings redemption, when Christ brings restoration, the only logical response is obedience. But look what obedience culminates into. Obedience isn't the end of the journey. It turns into something else. What did it turn into? Praise. Obedience overflows into worship. We become consumed with how good our God is. And then what happened? That worship became contagious. Everybody else started praising too including the crowd that got interrupted. Their grumpiness got turned into praise, including the disciples who were in a hurry to get there. Their frustration turned into praise. Worship, when rooted in obedience and a response to what Christ has done on our behalf, becomes infectious. It becomes a wildfire that simply cannot be contained. And may we be that. May we be a people who allow the King of Kings to open our eyes. And when our eyes are open, may we run hard after Christ. Obedience. May our obedience on a daily basis, a moment by moment basis, because that's where our trust is, moment by moment on this King, may it turn into worship praise for our king and may that worship may it be contagious may it spread may it open other eyes and those eyes then start running harder after jesus and this entire thing it just spreads like wildfire may that be who we are as we anticipate our king what he has done and what he's going to continue to do as he continues to arrive in people's hearts day by day Let's treasure him now. Let me pray for us. Father God, we thank you so much for this truth. And, and Lord, I thank you so much for Jesus, the Christ, your son, my savior, my king, my Lord. And Father God, as we now survey the fact that, that Jesus stopped in our lives, that he extended an invitation to we, the broken people, may we step confidently into that. If we've stepped into that before, may we do it again today. May it become a conscious moment by moment choice. Every minute of every single day, I'm stepping into the grace of the Lord Jesus. But if we've never made that decision, may today be the day that we start a journey with Jesus, that we step out of being a bystander and we join him in the movement forward. But Lord, as we do that, I pray that you teach us obedience, moment by moment obedience. 
May we be just as reliant on the Holy Spirit as our Lord was during his public ministry. As we rely on the Holy Spirit and as you teach us obedience moment by moment, may it culminate, may it, it, it quite literally explode into worship and praise for our King and may that be contagious and may it spread far beyond this room. May it spread into our communities, may it spread into our homes, our schools, our workplaces, our streets, may it spread everywhere. May redeemed people tell the story of redemption, not merely with words, but with actions that you are empowering. May we be the people of God and faithfully give testimony to the gospel, the journey that we've been invited on. We love you, Father. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.